I talked to many folks about this idea that I had, right, about the acquisition. There was one theme that each person I spoke to referenced, and that was hire a M&A attorney. You know, during a merger acquisition, there's a lot of room for the buyer and seller to do, to be greedy or to do things that are a little shady. And it was so important to me. My father always taught me to be fair and that I, I want to be able to sleep at night. And, you know, if it meant I could be a billionaire, but do things against my integrity, I'm not going to do it. How do you prepare for the unknown during this process? to Mergers and Acquisitions, a conversation hosted and sponsored by Comcast in partnership with Eastern Minority Supplier Development Council. This segment is where we share stories and experiences of minority business owners who are impacting economic growth and inclusion of MBEs in the business world. I am your host, Kristen Arnoldy. This is a special topic for me here today. I work for Dexian. We rebranded from Digital Intelligence Systems and Signature Consultants after a merger and acquisition in early 2021. Today, we're delving into a powerful conversation with two extraordinary women, business owners, sharing their experience and insights on mergers and acquisitions. I'd like to introduce Amanda Chevalier, president of CFI Workspace, and Patricia Claybrook, president of Jadan Cleaning. Thank you both, Amanda and Pat, for joining us today. Can you briefly introduce yourselves and tell us about your business? My name is Pat Claybrook, and I own Jadan Cleaning. I recently acquired Pico Services property uh, maintenance a year ago. So Jadan Cleaning provides interior commercial cleaning. So office cleaning, strip and wax floors, um, carpet cleaning, window cleaning, etc. Pico provides um, outdoor cleaning. So we do landscaping, we do snow removal, sweep parking lots, power washing. And the whole idea was to provide um, commercial buildings the opportunity to utilize one business that could provide cleaning for their interior and exterior needs. Uh, we are based in New Jersey with offices in Philadelphia and in uh, Baltimore. Hi, my name is Amanda Chevalier, and I'm the president and owner of CFI Workspace. We are a certified Miller Knoll dealership. Uh, what that means is we um, sell Herman Miller and Knoll corporate office furniture, as well as the complimentary services that come along with that. We essentially work with our customers, architecture and design uh, companies to create a workspace that entices their employees to want to be there, a space that's functional, beautiful and inclusive of all the employees. So let's jump right in. I'm curious to learn more about your recent mergers and acquisitions in light of the recent trends towards smaller M&A deals and challenges posed by economic uncertainties. What prompted your decisions to explore merger and acquisition? Were there specific growth opportunities or challenges that drove these strategic moves? Good question. So this was during COVID that I had this brilliant idea. Right. And it was driven by my exit strategy. Right. That if I acquired a business that was complementary to what I we were already offering, it would make us even more enticing for someone to want to purchase us. Right. And so I was on a mailing list 
for a company that represented sellers. And I first I was interested in another cleaning company in a different part of New Jersey. And after doing our due diligence, we decided that was not a good compliment. And then Pico came across my desk and I and I said, oh, their services complement our services. And then that started the road um, to us acquiring Pico. So if we rewind uh, about four years ago, we were uh, the exclusive null distributor in the greater Philadelphia area. Um, and then fast forward to about a year into COVID, and Knoll, the manufacturer, was purchased by Herman Miller, which is the larger competitor to Knoll. So now you have um, Herman Miller and Knoll becoming one company, and the amount of distributors have doubled. So we were the exclusive, and now we have all these other competitors in our market. So our, our decision is really driven by the manufacturer. The due diligence phase in mergers and acquisitions is often intimidating. And it's a very large first step, especially for small businesses. Can you share your advice on how you navigated that process? I talked to many folks about this idea that I had, right, about the acquisition. And there was one theme that each person I spoke to referenced, and that was hire a M&A attorney. You have your own attorney that's good at, you know, a general practice practicing attorney, but if you're serious about a merger or an acquisition, you need someone who specializes in M&A. That's all they do, right? So that started the process of me interviewing, I think it was seven M&A attorneys, right? So that's seven attorneys who had all different uh, pricing um, and different styles Right. Some were men, some were women, some were just a diversity across the board. So that was that was my first big decision that I had to make um, and also align myself with my with the right team. So I have my accountant involved, my CPA. I have my business coach involved, um, my husband involved. So my um, th then I had some my banker. So I, I built this team around me to help me make the right decisions, to tell me what to look out for, because I had never done this before, right? And so that started, it was almost, took almost a year from the minute that I signed the, um, the LOI, letter of, of intent, to, to when we closed. Wow. It's a long process, but it's a lot of people that helped you along the way. Yes. How about you, Amanda? I would agree exactly with what Patricia is saying to make sure you have experts. It's such a specialized thing, M&A. So just coincidentally, we were hiring for a new VP of finance and I came across a resume of a really amazing person and they happened to have an M&A background. So he started to navigate us through the process and the attorney we had is a corporate attorney as well as a CPA who had a lot of experience with M&A because that is just so key to this whole thing working. Um, you know, after we signed the letter of intent, um, during the due diligence, we did not have disclosure. The seller was very um, concerned about uh, negative things coming out. In hindsight, that wasn't, I would not recommend that um, because it made the due diligence process a lot more difficult. Um, just going through the financials and even things that were more like not as financially driven, um, contracts with vendors, things like that were, um, are really things to look out for. I think a lot of times people are so focused on the financials, they don't look at the thousand vendors over 50 years that have not been closed, the credit, all those things that are not um, as obvious. Those are great points. And that leads me to some of the challenges. Just from hearing both of you, I can understand some of those, some of those processes alone created some challenges. What has been the most difficult challenge? This is the first time that I've done this, right? So I, I've been saying since that, since this happened a year ago, that the first time you do anything, it's a heavy lift. Like the first time I gave birth compared to the second time. It's just, you don't know what you don't know. And when you go through an acquisition, there are a lot of things that, that you're not going to know until you're able to lift that hood up yourself and, and look, right? Because you can, the financials look great, right? But there's so many other pieces that are important. Like I think the financials are easy mm -hmm. to look at and decipher, right? But but then you're talking about does the culture match your culture, right? 
Are the employees going to stay, right? Are the current contractors or um, accounts, once they know that this person has sold the business who's owned it for 20 plus years and they have that relationship and then you, you're acquiring it and they don't know you, are they, how's that going to impact them? There's so many variables and that's why I go back to it's important to really, one, I think, like, like have a relationship with the seller as part of the transition. So there's, there's so, so many. And for me, the most challenging part, I'm a type A personality, right? I, you know, that whole trust the process, <laughs> right? So many times I had to say trust the process because I want to know what I need to know and I want to know it today. So that, that's, that was hard. All of what you just said resonates so well with me. So type A personality, definitely don't like an unknown. So I, I completely understand that. And you mentioned trust. And I think when it comes to mergers and acquisitions, it's so important to have that trust. And how can you instill that with your employees when you're talking about culture, which we'll get to. But for you, Amanda, what has been your the culture, I would agree with Patricia, absolutely. And we we had um, awareness of that going into it. Um, I think a lot of people say, you know, merger, but the truth is it's always an acquisition. So the merger is kind of a polite way of saying, you know, we're not buying everything. Uh, it's important for people to remember that it's not the new company's way or the old company's way. You are just a different company. And that was a really key piece for us to realize, like, people are not going to suddenly be, oh, the CFI way or the Spectrum way, but this is the new way. So we're a new company and no one's better or worse than each other. We're going to do this together. How did you prioritize culture? Did you prioritize culture? And what did that mean for you during and after the deal? We kind of rebranded our events, whether it was a social event or a meeting. Uh, so it was like new, new kinds. It wasn't the CFI meeting or the Spectrum meeting. It was, you know, we're not going to have the monthly meeting. We're going to do this once a week. So, for example, um, if we had uh, like a certain Christmas party, now we're having a, a holiday party at a different time, a different date. So it's not the old way or the new or the old way. It's just a different way. Um, we had a lot of company events with just employees. We added like a summer picnic for uh, employees as well as their families so that people could see, you know, this is who I work with every day. Um, and just focusing on realizing this is their life and you guys are important to us. You're the most important thing we have. Absolutely. When I think back to our rebranding for Dexian, one of the reasons was because we were now a new company. No old cultures. No, we're this company, company A, we're company B. We are now Dexian. And that was really important for us as we moved forward from that rebranding. We just rebranded in May 2023. Um, but, but when you speak about culture, how has it been post-transition? It's been, it's been easy. That part of it, that piece of it, that's because great. what we like that that's very important to me because when you own a business that provides a service, my number one asset are my people, right? And so it was important for us to identify, when I say us, my husband and I, Maurice, to identify if the culture of Pico matched Jadan's culture. And if it didn't, that was going to be a deal breaker for me, right? Because I can't change. And I didn't want to have to come in and change a culture, right? And so the owners, a husband and wife, owned it for over 20 years. So during our get to know each other process, we got to know them and realized that their culture matched our culture, which is I live by treat others the way you would like to be treated. My um, team members, I don't even call them employees, are my family, right? So, and, I, and I'll say this, is that, not that I'm bragging, but the Jadan culture is a lot, was a lot, and is a lot friendlier and caring than the Pico culture. So the um, team members that were with Pico, after they got used to the idea of new owners, embraced what we brought to the table because it just made has made their working life so much better. Absolutely. And embracing a new culture is hard, 
but knowing when when they have the ability to trust and the integrity's there and they get to see that in the Jadan culture, it made it easier. Oh, absolutely. And I'll give you one quick example. The whole working from home, like the, the previous owner, the seller was very old school, like a real OG, right? And didn't understand that someone could work from home and be as productive at home as they were in the office. You know, and, and I'm really big on technology. If technology can help us be more efficient, I'm all for it. So, you know, we came in and got our two ladies that worked in the office, got them laptops and, and, and got them set up that they can work from home. You know, so just that alone was a shift that that they embraced. That's awesome. How about for you, Amanda? I think it's important uh, for people to understand that there is going to be attrition. And the people who want to stay will stay. And you, you're going to lose some people that you wanted to stay. But they're off to something better. And it's it's the best for everyone. Um, I think it was a perfect storm because we came back to work post-COVID, working from home. And then acquisition happened kind of simultaneously. So it was a good, a good start for people to just have a whole new way altogether. Um, we created new roles. We started uh, doing mission, vision, and values. So it forced our company uh, to come up with that because we hadn't done that since the 90s. Uh, and that really helped us form a new culture. Awesome. I know when we talk about culture and we talk about our employees, um, and I like what you say about them being team members, not calling them employees. Think about communication. And communication, it's often cited as critical element in the success of mergers and acquisitions, how did you manage the communication with your employees, your customers, your stakeholders throughout the transition? Any valuable lessons that you've learned? I would say over communicate. I, I didn't realize how important it was for especially employees to know everything that was going on. Uh, so after the integration, uh, we started doing like a once a week meeting, doing once a month town halls and telling them more than you think they want to know. It's It's been really helpful and getting feedback for them and kind of fine tuning what they do and don't want to hear. Um, for stakeholders during the process, our manufacturer, uh, Miller Knoll, knew everything that was going on and just talking to them on a couple times a week basis. I was surprised that it wasn't as uh, important to customers as, as I thought. Um, they, I think, are pretty flexible and used to having vendors be bought out or merging with other companies. And for them, it was like, okay, let's move on. It's really the employees that was a big deal. This is their, their daily life where they come every day. They've been coming, some of our employees, over 30 years. I agree with that. Um, with the, with customers or accounts and contracts, they just want they just want to make sure that, one, we're going to get the same service or better and you're not going to increase my prices. That's all. Those are the two things they care about. But I think in this process, the most important um, folks to communicate with, over communicate, are your employees, right? The team members. And what we try to do is, when we talked about the the acquisition, was to lead with why. Why why is this going to be beneficial to them, right? How is this going to improve? their lives. And so, you know, we sent out a newsletter, we had uh, meetings, and, and always talked about the why, what's in it for them. And, you know, I'm a big believer that in any relationship, um, starts and ends or um, flourishes or not based on communication. So, we had, you know, some, uh, what, what, what did we call it? it was a catchy phrase, um, chat with Pat, <laughs> um, sessions that employees can sign up for, and they can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me and ask me anything about um, the, the uh, acquisition. I love that. I love the chat with Pat. Yeah. And it gives them a direct line to you to right. talk with you directly mm -hmm. about any concerns, mm -hmm. which is really or, important. Or questions. Mm -hmm. Over communication is just like, it almost feels... It gets a given, but you don't really realize what you could be missing if you're not really tapping into your employees and understanding how they feel and what kind of changes they're going through. And also, your acquisitions both happened post-COVID, right? So there was a lot of uncertainties. And I think it's important to take action, even if you acknowledge that it might not be the right choice. Rather than something be baked in, go for it and acknowledge, you know what, that wasn't the right move, but we tried it and we're going to, we're not perfect, we're going to recalibrate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And owning it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
understanding, you know, Pat, you acquired a business that complemented the business you already owned and began. And Amanda, you acquired a business that would ultimately make you more of that sole distributor, like that, you know, um, the growth, more of that growth. So when you think about that, and um, I want to talk about the positive changes that you have seen, you know, going through m and and, you know, we've talked, we discussed the hurdles, we've dis- we discussed the strategy behind it, but, and there's always those challenges, but what are some of the positives that you're seeing? You want to go first? Sure. So we doubled in size, so it allowed us to really restructure the company and provide. So we we basically are selling services as well, selling products and services. So our sellers are the ones that can only sell. So taking away the work from them that others can do. So we've added um, extra departments and layers to support them and ultimately our customers. That's I think that's the ultimate um, positive. For us, a big positive is that, which was my initial, you know, reason for for the acquisition, is that we can go to an anchor institution in the city of Philadelphia and say that, you know, we we can provide you with all of these services, one stop shopping, and a lot of larger institutions prefer dealing with one vendor versus five or six because of all of the different um, services that we provide. And I'll be honest that we, and we just had a meeting about this, is it's only been 12 months and now we're really going to start digging into um, marketing that aspect of both businesses that we can, you know, provide that one-stop shopping when it comes to cleaning. How can we show support to businesses that are looking to include M&A in their business plan? Well, I think I think one is you have to be in a have a growth mindset, right? You know, um, even ten years ago, someone said to me about acquisition. I was like, "Oh no, acquisition! I'm never going to acquire it because it just seemed like such a monumental task that little old me is going to actually buy another business, right? I'm just trying to stay afloat, right? But if you have a growth mindset. You have to come to the realization that you can only grow so much organically. So how else are you going to grow, right? And so that's where the idea of the acquisition came into place with the, remember, it's driven by my exit strategy, right? What, as an entrepreneur, what is your goal, right? And how does m and fit into that goal? And it's about people planting those seeds in your mind. Like the person that planted that seed for me was James Sanders, um, and a lot of us know James, but he planted that seed with me over eight years ago about an acquisition. So I, I think it goes back to your growth mindset, what your goals are, and then talking talking to different people and putting the right resources around you to come to the right decision is important. I think it's important to understand your industry and what's happening within the industry and then decide if you want to be the buyer or the seller because there's a lot of selling nowadays and people are looking for private equity to kind of um, get out. Um, But if you are going to be a buyer, like Patricia said, a growth mindset and also keeping in mind just because you sell right now one product or service doesn't mean you can't create other business units with that core core group and having an open mind and just seeing, you know, with technology and AI, how things are rapidly evolving. And if you have that core group of people, uh, you can turn it into a lot of other things. Talking about the growth mindset you've both mentioned, we've seen companies deepen their commitment to supplier diversity and community engagement. Do you feel there are any unique challenges for diverse owned businesses looking for M&A opportunities? And where would you like to see improvements? If you do someday want to be a seller, you can only sell it to a much smaller group than if you were not diverse owned. Or you could sell it and you're not going to get the value of being a certified MBE. So that's, I guess that's just something to look out for. Yeah, that's great insight, though. It's a great point. Show me the money. Meaning that diverse businesses have unfortunately, an upward battle when it comes to financing, right? Because you can't, well, not that you can't, but 
usually you can't complete an acquisition unless you have financing, right? And I don't think that enough banks, et cetera, really think about you as the individual. Like they, they don't, they're not creative enough, right? They don't think out the box enough. They have a box and they want you to fit into that box. Well, I might not fit into that box. I'm, this might be a great deal for me, right? But or a great deal for, for them, but, but they have their rigid box. And if you don't fit into it, then you don't meet their criteria. Thus, you can't get your financing. I also think that what we have to remember is that you can't, I don't want to say a double negative, but as, as an entrepreneur, you have to have relationships with, with banks and CDFIs and, you know, others that venture capital, that when you are ready to make, to do an M&A, that you have, you can't start the relationship then, if that makes sense, right? You need, you need to start the relationship now, even if you don't want to do an M&A, but maybe you need a line of credit, right? Maybe you need to purchase vehicles, Maybe you need to invest in more inventory, right? So it's build those relationships now. Know your financials. Like make sure that you know your balance sheet and your um, you know your cash flow statements. All your financial statements are in order. And something that someone shared with me a long time ago is is to get the financing when you don't really need it, because then when you do need it, like you find yourself up against the wall. So start putting your ducks in a row before you actually need the financing. I think there's definitely areas of improvement in the financing world when it comes to MBEs and even small businesses. Mm -hmm. Are there any resources that you can share that would help other businesses during their M&A processes? I think this platform is a great start. EMSDC uh, or NMSDC as a whole, uh, supporting their members and, and the community with uh, you know videos like this, as well as being knowing names and reaching out. Because I think for the most part, we're willing to share the information. We're happy to share because we want uh, the minority community to have all the same chances that everyone else does, and so often we don't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, there's SBA, right? Um, the Enterprise Center in, in Philadelphia. That's a good resource. Like a, there are a lot of organizations that within the organization, there are folks that have gone through this process or, or the people that you need to help you go through the process are part of those organizations, like the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, the New Jersey um, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, so there are a lot of resources out here and and it, that's part of you as the owner that's part of your due diligence that, that you have to pick up the phone or go to websites and I did a lot of a lot of reading and I try to reach out to a lot of folks that have done this before to pick their bringing sometimes I didn't know what what questions to ask but I just said to them tell me your story how did you do this you know what were what were the pitfalls that if you could tell me three things not to do, what would those three things be? So I just started talking to people and, and picking their brain. It also helps with the unknown. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yes. <laughs> what has been the most rewarding for your companies and you personally? I came to this country as a six-year-old little girl from Port of Spain, Trinidad. And... I thank my parents, especially my dad, to have the vision to bring his family here for, a, for all the things that he didn't have in Trinidad, right? And so I was the first one in my family to graduate with a four-year degree, and, and, and I have a daughter who has her PhD, okay? Um, so when I, when I think back about this entrepreneurial journey, yes, it's been challenging, you know, but on my worst day, I always say it's better than working for someone else, right? And I love the fact that I am impacting 
the team members that work for me. You know, yesterday I had a conversation with someone who's interested in buying my companies, right? And he mentioned blue collar company, right? Yeah, yes, we are blue collar. And, and I'm proud of that, right? And so on a daily basis, I get to impact and help change the trajectory of the folks that work for me when they know that someone that looks like them um, employs them, cares about them. You know, a couple of years ago, we started during COVID. A lot, start, a lot started during COVID. We started a 401k, right? And some of them didn't know. We had to go through months of educating them about what is a 401k and why that 401k was... Um, beneficial for them and their families, right? So when I look back, yes, I started this to betterment of my family, but I am motivated over the last five to seven years in seeing how this idea that I had, you know, Jadan cleaning, how it's impacting the lives of the folks that, that I get to employ. And that's special. That is special. How about you, Amanda? So uh, the company's been in business since 1985, and I think we were becoming a bit complacent, and this really gave us a bit of a kick and to relook at things and just improve wherever we could. And um, I think we have. I think we always will be. I think it's important to remember that you're never finished. Integration is never really over. It's been 13 months since this happened. Um, I'm very glad I feel that we've been very honest with our employees and been able to follow through with the moral parts of everything we said. Not everything we wanted to happen happened, but we've been very honest with them and I think that they feel uh, we care about them. It was really important uh, that the company, the seller, is someone that I deeply respect, uh, that we treated her company with, with all the love and care that she put into it for all these years because it's important to remember this is someone's baby. Some that's a company, and just to share with everyone, like show the dignity and respect to this company um, that you have for your own company, because this, this is something someone nurtured and grew for years. Absolutely. Yeah. Considering what you've both have built, and talking about the transitions and the culture and the challenges, looking back, what advice would you give to others considering mergers and acquisitions as a growth strategy? What are some key takeaways from your experience that you'd like to share? So even though you, you're going to come up with um, strategy and a plan, it's important to be flexible and realize that have a plan, but plan for the plan, not going according to plan. Because a lot of things come out of the woodwork and uh, a lot of surprises, but being aware that this is going to happen is really important. Uh, I think having a group, like a committee, that's dedicated to the merger and acquisition and assigning roles so that's very clear who's doing what. Um, you know, something that was heartbreaking for me is we lost a customer who had been with us 20 years. And what he said to me was, during the integration when you bought this other company, I felt like you didn't care about us. And he was right because our eye was not on our existing customers as much as it should have been. So in hindsight, um, that's something we absolutely should have done a better job with having people look out for all the existing customers and not so focused on the future. M&A attorney. That's a big one. Um, trust the process. You, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, folks that are where you want to be as far as the M in the M&A world, to pick their brains, right? And use what they have shared with you to your betterment, right? Understand that you're not gonna know everything and that you, you, you definitely have to be flexible because there are things coming at you on a daily basis, right? And accept the fact that, like I said, stated before, that you're not gonna know everything until, until you own the business. There's some things that you're just not gonna know until you own the business. Um, Make sure that you are adequately funded. And what I mean by that is you have the, the funding to purchase the business and then make sure that you have six to nine months of funding to run the business, right? So for us, there was a period of time that it took for the um, 
current customers to switch over to us. We were going to get the money, but their own internal processes that they had to go through took a little, you know, took a little time. So just make sure that you have enough capital and fundings to keep that you can run your run the business even for six months, nine months, a year would be perfect on top of, you know, how you're financing the purchase of the business. Those are the, the key takeaways I would I think of. Yeah. Pat, can you dive more in about the M&A attorney and that process? Okay. So it was um, highly suggested that I find an M&A attorney. And it was explained to me that even though I had, Jadan Cleaning had a, general practicing attorney who dabbles in a little bit of everything, that the process of an acquisition, I need someone that this is all that they do every day. And so I just started reaching out to people that I trusted. So I reached out to my my bank because they they have their own uh, attorneys that they deal with. I reached out to um, some folks that that are kind of like my pseudo advisory board and they um, recommended some folks. So I had about seven attorneys and I called, set up appointments with each one and I let each one discuss or explain to me who they were and the services that they provide and how they could help me, right? And so like one of the differences was like one of them belong to a large firm that he can handle the acquisition, but then someone else in his firm could handle the piece when it comes to the HR piece related to employees of the um, of the company that I wanted to, to acquire. So that was one example. Um, they ranged in such different hourly ranges as far as cost that I found that intriguing. They also ranged as far as how long they thought the whole process would take. I spoke to um, attorneys that looked like me. I spoke to some that didn't look like me. I spoke to women. Like I wanted a diverse group of which to pick from. And then after all that being said, I'm a big believer in going with your gut. You know, my gut hasn't failed me in 61 years. So I went with my gut and I, um, and that, that was, that was my process, but it was asking a lot of questions, you know, and having them sell themselves and letting them know that, yeah, I'm looking, I'm interviewing different ones. How are you different? You know, what's your, what's your plan or process to help me, you know, make these right decisions? Yeah. Who was going to walk you through the unknowns? Right, right. Back to and that prepare word. You. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Amanda. And talking more about communication, did you talk to more of your clients before the M and A as well? So we weren't able to share the information until the actual acquisition. We had a, an NDA signed. Uh, however, when Herman Miller purchased Knoll. Many of our clients were asking us or some were even teasing us or joking. It would be great if we could buy everything from you. We could buy Herman Miller and Knoll, not just Knoll. So when the deal happened, I think not a lot of people were surprised. Although we thought it was a big secret, um, it wasn't so much. It would have been helpful if we had been able to disclose pre merger to get their feedback and thoughts, um, how we could improve or even um, other services that we could sell. My answer is almost exactly the same <laughs> because there's during the process, there are many things that you can't say, people you can't tell, right? And so all I did was, you know, just I just talked to a few people, not my customers, but well, some were like that are in larger entities to say to them, if we could offer these services on top of what we already offer, would that be attractive to you? And I got a resounding yes all the way around. And so now it behooves us, to this, you know, for us to really get out there and market that. Yeah. 
through the process of merger and acquisition, how did your acquisitions and growth help you obtain larger customers? So scale, I would say scaling uh, double in size that we have a much deeper bench of resources to provide the services that a customer who might not have looked at us two years ago is saying, you know what, I think CFI Workspace can handle this. Let's give them an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So through our acquisition, we also doubled in size and revenue. You know, we added 35 to 40 full-time employees and um, I also purchased the land that Pico was on, which is eight acres of land with buildings. So there's a lot of assets, right? And so that legitimizes us even more when, when we're going after larger contracts, not just the services that we now can offer, but um, it just it, people feel better about us. You know that that we have a little more skin in the game, as they as they would say, um, and so and it also <laughs> financing has become easier. At least more people want to talk to me now. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me to get a call now. You know th that they are more interested in speaking to us, speaking to me because of where we're at now, um, because of the the, the acquisition. So I think it has opened up um, more doors to larger entities as far as customers and, and also more options when it comes to financing. As a small business, how do you know when you're ready for an M&A? I think in some ways you're, you're never quite ready, uh, but it's really dictated by the economy and what's going on to external forces. And if you don't grow, uh, someone else is going to grow and cannibalize you. So uh, let's be proactive and be the one to do it first. Do you want to grow? Like, is that part? Of, is that part of your? Is that part of your plan? Right. I'm a big believer in plans. Like I tell people, I'm not a wing it kind of girl. Never have been. Never will be. Right. And so, whether it's an acquisition or whether it's applying for PPP. You have to be ready, right? And the basis for all of that goes back to your financials, to me anyway, right? And so as a small business owner, daily you should have your ducks in a row so that when opportunities come across your desk, that, that you can take advantage of them. You know, those opportunities could be PPP. Those opportunities could be an acquisition. You know, those opportunities could be purchasing land, like what, whatever it is, but it comes back to basic fundamentals that you need to take advantage of opportunities, that you have to be ready. Pat, you've mentioned about leaning on many people throughout this process. Can you both tell us a little bit more about the support system that you leaned on throughout the process, your families, your friends, mentors? And my faith. Like, that's a big one for me. I lean on him. You don't know how many times during this process I said, Jesus, take the wheel, like literally. But my, my biggest support has always been my husband, Maurice. So Maurice was the COO of Jadan, and now he runs Pico. And without his support, just, you know, just in life, right? Um, and through and in our businesses, I can't explain how important that has been. You know, even and it might sound cliches, but even a hug. You know, to say yes, you're doing the right. Because so many times I doubted myself during this part. Am I doing the right thing? How is this going to impact Jadan? How is this going to impact Pico? Now we I own all this land and these build like just so many. In your head, you're asking, am I doing the right thing? Am I, why am I doing this? Is this going to be good for it? Like, so to have someone in your corner that doesn't yes you to death or give you the answers that you want to hear, but it's being honest with you. And that's always been 
Um, he's always been there for me. That's that's Maurice and my my parents and my and my daughters. Like this was a a family decision because it impacts the whole family. And so they they've been always been my number one support. How about you, Amanda? So I'm a single mother and I have two teenage boys. Um, so it's why am I doing this, right? Like for me, it's like it's about them and just remembering why you're doing it and not neglect them because during this like anxiety ridden time, there were absolutely times where I was cranky, miserable, you know, unaccessible. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about them. My older sister was an incredible source of support and I could not have gotten through it without her. She actually works with me and was part of this process, but she kind of wore two hats, the work side and outside of work. And she was always there for me, but also telling me when she didn't agree with me and not just being a yes person and just telling me like it is. During this process, the M&A process, there's a lot of unknowns. You're walking into discussions with people you don't know, attorneys that may be new, um, advisors that are, you know, might be saying different things, you know, one way or the other. How do you prepare for the unknown during this process? I always tell my my children, don't ever be afraid to say you don't understand or tell me more. And I think that's a, a key piece is when you when you're dealing with all these attorneys and banks and CPAs, they're using a lot of dark jargon and you might not be following, but just say like, hey, can you explain that to me? Because when you hear that, you're you're learning and it's opening your mind to new things that you might not know. And having that diversity of professionals along along the journey with you really helps uh, show you new things and how to handle it and give you advice. You know, my my acquisition, my loan is millions of dollars, right? So I went from zero debt to millions of dollars in debt. And when, when I was going through the process and I'm thinking about that, I think that gave me the fuel when you're talking about all those dollars and cents to ask as many questions. You know, I'm a big believer in raising my hand and saying, I don't know. Help me to understand. You know, help me to help me to to feel comfortable about whatever it is. And, and I just, and I would talk to different people. You know, I don't take your word as bond, as we would say, right? Um, I trust you, but I want to get another opinion, right? And so, and also to have an air of confidence, not cockiness, right? But, but confidence. I also think that there was a dynamic of me being a woman during this process that some folks that I interacted with at some time tried to make me feel less than because I was a woman. And, and, you, and you, you, you have to come from a place of, of, you know, I say fake it till you make it, right? Like to be confident in who you are and confident in what you're trying to accomplish and not be afraid to ask questions. Because at any time during this process, I could, I could have said, no, this is not going to happen, right? You always, you always have that ability to stop the process um, if that's what you, you choose to do. If you could go back in time and do it all over again, what would you do differently? Two things, and it has to do with people and financing. Right. And the and the people piece would, would be that I wish that we as buyers could have interacted or connected with key employees earlier in the process. And then the financing part is I wish I would have asked for more money. Like that, you know, that six to nine months of working capital. I wish that um, we would have asked for that. How about you, Amanda? So after the uh, post acquisition, we didn't have our eye on our existing customers as much as we should have. So the management team was so focused on the integration that one, we you know 
uh, didn't focus on our existing customers as much. And two, our funnel of sales really dried up because we weren't prospecting and looking for new customers. So right now we're in this lull. Uh, the other piece is, is similar to Patricia's, I think, that uh, we didn't have a disclosure period. There was, there was an NDA in place and there was a lot of... Um, confidential things going on. It got to the point with the seller and I'm very friendly with her. We were literally meeting in dark bars at 11 in the morning and I felt like I was doing something like elite, like I was having an affair or something. And I, it got to the point, I was, I'm not comfortable with this. This feels so sneaky. Um, and there are aspects during that period of NDA that we weren't able to explore. We weren't able to talk to um, people, understand how they did things, what they thought could be better. And I know the, you know, the NDAs and we, we keep silent over a lot of those things. But I think that that's one thing that I think companies miss in M&A is that transparency. And you mentioned it about wanting PICO employees to understand and embrace that they're not your employees. They're your family. They're your team members. And that you care about them and that you love them all the same and you treat them with open arms and chat with Pat. And when you think about those things and what that communication can do earlier on and throughout an entire transition period, it really can affect a post, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. M&A mm -hmm. deal. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. for our managers, it, it and it wasn't fair to them. They didn't know what was going on. And then one day they're managing 12 people. And the next day you're like, oh, you now have 24 people you have to manage. And they're like, what? They, they, you know, I can see how they could feel a little betrayed by that. But it's like you you need to follow like the law. And that was that was very difficult. And then you're throwing more unknowns at 12 more people, right? Yes. Of not yeah. knowing. So absolutely. So even though it's an acquisition right now, we're operating as two different companies. For Pico, it was really spending time as far as them getting to know Maurice and getting to know me. Well, getting to know me less because he's Maurice is running the show, right? And the kind of people that we are, you know, you know, um, owners that you can trust that that care about you, and we show that in many different ways, but we also had to make sure that it was articulated to the, our PICO team what our core values are, right? And what our mission statement, is, mission and vision. And so one of the first things that Maurice did was we, we um, brought back someone that used to work for PICO and brought him back as an ops manager. Right. So we wanted to make make sure that it's it's from top down. Right. And so we've had several um, meetings, workshops with Jadan management and Pico management as one. Right. And that we all we all understand what our mission and vision and values are and that we live those and that we make decisions based on the mission, vision and values and, and to live it daily. And to do, you know, do things like, it might sound cramped, but we do like monthly newsletters. Like, like that's what we always did at Jadam. Pico never, we never did that. So monthly newsletters and acknowledging milestones in people's lives, making them realize how important they really are to this, to the success of Pico. You know, so doing little things on a daily basis that, that shows them that we care. And I think that's a big piece of our culture. What is the best investment you can make personally for yourself during this process? Every morning, and I put, it's on my calendar. If it's not on my calendar, it doesn't happen. At 6.30, I do a Bible study with 12 people every morning from 6.30 to 7. That starts my day, right? <laughs> But it's little things. Drink mm -hmm. a lot of, drink lots of water. I, I, I like being outside, so I, I try to do three miles every day. I try to take time during my day just to sit still and just think. Th those are all things that help me to be. Yeah, it's talked about that um, better when you're on, like people are just scrolling through. Like no one's taking that time to think. Yeah. anymore you know they're scrolling through their phones they're running around or they're watching a show and yeah. they go right to bed and 
there's none of that personal time to yeah. yourself. And, I, and and even though that's a priority, I still feel that I can do more when it comes to that, right? Um, you know, as you get older, quieting your mind becomes more of a challenge because I'm thinking about, I need to do this, I need to do that. And, you know, I get 200 to 250 emails every day and I'm, and I'm a type A, so I only want like 50 in my inbox at a time. So I got to get those emails out of there <laughs> so I can't go to sleep. You know, like, so I'm always on that, like a, on that, yeah. that wheel, that mouse uh-huh. going around. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. And it's, it's not good. Right. So I have to find ways to, um, to do better. I think, uh, you know, maintaining your integrity is really important. You draw the line in the sand and you don't cross it. And once you do, it's it's just a rabbit hole. Um, you know, during a merger acquisition, there's a lot of room for the buyer and seller to do to be greedy or to do things that are a little um, shady. And it was so important to me. I mean, my father always taught me be fair and that I, I want to be able to sleep at night and, you know, if it meant I could be a billionaire, but do things against my integrity, I'm not going to do it. It's not worth it. Um, feel good about what you're doing and um, don't cross that line. How do you maintain a positive mindset as a single mom throughout this process? Yeah, so I'm I'm adopted. I'm from Korea. I was an orphan. And I just feel so appreciative of being here in this country. When I was born in the 70s, Korea was a third world country. And, you know, people ask me, do you want to find your like real parents? My parents are my real parents. And I'm, you know, appreciative of my biological parents putting me up for adoption and allowing me to come to this great country and have way more opportunities here than I would have living in Korea. So that, you know, I think being grateful and appreciate making appreciation every day for what you have. Amanda, Pat, thank you so much for joining us today in this conversation on m and sharing your insights and experiences. Thank you, Comcast and EMSDC as well as the Spectacore team here at the Wells Fargo Center providing this awesome backdrop. Thank you so much for tuning in. 